Now, we'll talk about the last section, that is Science, Technology and Innovation Policy in India. At the time of independence, clearly there were very important challenges in front of the policy makers. India at the time was a technology laggard. The availability of technologies, the recent developments in scientific developments were not available in the country. As a result, it was pointed out, maybe the importation of technology could be a very important way through which an access could be given to the newer technologies. That can also bring in awareness among the domestic producers about the new changes in the market and will help them in not only understanding them but also adapting and adopting to the local requirements. In that context, clearly, there was a need to balance the development which will happen in-house vis-a-vis that of the importation. Clearly, the objective was not to become dependent on the Western or the advanced nations for the access and availability of technology. That can be seen in light of the recent independence that the country has received from the British colonizers. So, self-reliance was the focus. However, having identified that maybe the existing technologies can be accessed, imported in order to learn. So, against that background, you please understand that in 1947, most influential scientists, industrials and politicians, there were consensus that there is a very important role with science and technology going to play in this new India as such and for its economic development. At that time, the Prime Minister was supported by Homi Bhabha, Meghanath Saha and S.S. Bhatnagar in drawing plans and shaping the Indian science and technology innovation system for the national development. The idea was, let us first begin by establishing the national laboratories which can be emerged uh, as specialized research centers. Hence, substantive investment was made into such laboratories. Moreover, the focus was space and atomic energies. To ensure food security, in 70s what we have seen is a green revolution, which was supported by the Indian Council of Agricultural Research. So, if you look at the investments that were being made in the science and technology ecosystem at that point of a time, you realize that the major support was given to space and nuclear science and technology. Department of Space and Department of Atomic Energy were consuming most of the resources. Next, we have already discussed the CSIR laboratories being playing a very important role in terms of the investment being made in R&D. Moreover, how they were also being the focus of creation of the technology and that one which can be translated to the market. But there was a set certain setbacks in terms of the translation. We realized that, that the research labs were not able to come up with the outcome which were very directly translated to the market. Even if they were able to come up, there was a lot of lag involved. So I'm referring to the size paper which we have studied in the fourth module as such. Then we have witnessed major changes in the 1970s. These were related to patent policy and foreign exchange regulatory act. We have understood the impact of these two on the foreign firms which were prevalent in the economy at that point of our time. Because of the changes in the patent policy, many pharmaceutical companies which were engaged in the product development, they have to leave the market but also at the same time create space for the domestic um, players in order to develop their technological capabilities. Similar impact was also seen because of the FERA. Now, the regime, if you look at it in terms of overall environment, was also in alignment with the overall industrial policy which was there in place at that point of our time. As I said earlier, self-reliance was a major focus. Initially, there was this understanding that the technology is available with the international companies and we might have to engage with them, either giving a certain, you know, larger portion of ownership of, of the companies or maybe, you know, getting into uh, some kind of a technology transfer agreements. And uh, this also we have understood when we looked at the foreign direct investment policy. So, in alignment with the overall control or regulated regime, you find that major investments were being made in order to create a infrastructure for the science and technological development. But there were 
certain loopholes and uh, Chaturvedi and Srinivas in their paper in 2015 is noted that an unintended co consequence was the weakening of the science and technology capacity in the universities despite the expansion of higher education sector because universities were being treated more from the point of view of the place where the when we are more teaching can happen and CSIR labs were being created from the point of view of re undertaking research. So if you look at the specific document which we will now talk about and they are targeting this creation of the science and technology innovation ecosystem in the country. So in we have these documents. First we had the science and technology policy statement which came in 1958. We have a technology policy statement in 1983. Then science and technology policy statement which came in 2003. STPS 2000 essentially focused on the need for SNT together with the indigenous knowledge base and as a part of the industrial base that need to be created for growth. SNT and innovation policy in 2013 again will leading to the establishment of national innovation council celebration of the national innovation decade as well. So let us just briefly look at these. So scientific policy resolution of 1958, the first science policy, the aim was to develop scientific enterprise and scientific temper in India. Most importantly, it was felt that scientific temper is something which is of much requirement for a developing economy uh, like India at that point of a term. In 1983, what we see is a technology policy statement. There the objective was to become technologically self-reliant and here the focus was also in the indigenous development of the technologies. Adoption was basically to reduce the vulnerability and also to optimize the allocation of local resources. In 2003, we see that in order to maintain competitiveness and achieve sustainable development, science and pol technology policy tools were rather be used. There was also more investment in R&D uh, and in 2013, a decade of innovation was celebrated from 2010 to 2020. The idea was that we should be developing an economy which is now a knowledge based economy. This policy document was a step in direction towards building robust national innovation ecosystem. Now, if we go by the broader conceptualization of STI policy, innovation policies that we have seen in the works of Professor Basan, we also need to understand the overall economic policies in that particular duration. We have already looked at an extremely regulated regime before uh, economic liberalization in 1991 and after that we have seen as the markets opened up not only the foreign direct investment was allowed the competition among with the domestic firms also increased patent policy was had undergone major changes these changes were made in order to comply with the requirements of the world trade organization for which india was a founding member then we have seen an increasement in the R&D support through the R&D tax credit, tax holidays, etc. And most importantly, in the last uh, two years, we have seen a science, technology and innovation policy 2020. So the broad vision of science, technology and innovation policy 2020 is to attain technological self-reliance, to strengthen human capital through a people-centric science, technology and innovation ecosystem, to double the number of full-time equivalent researchers, GD, P, which is being spent on R&D in private sector and uh, includes the contribution which is being made by the private sector. The idea is also to form individual and institutional excellence in STI to obtain the highest level of global recognition. We have time and again pointed out that the investment by uh, in the gross domestic expenditure on research and development is rather low in the Indian context and there is a need to boost that towards the international levels. If you look at overall uh, achievements which has been made by India in science, technology and innovation area in recent years, these are rather encouraging. So in terms of uh, SCI journals, we find that the total number of publications, we are third in position. We are also third in position in terms of the number of PhDs that are being granted, third largest higher education system of the world, third position in terms of number of startups. Our rank has rather increased in global innovation uh, index from 81st position in 2015 to 48 and in the recent report it is around 40th. 
3.4 lakh R&D personnel has been working, almost 40% increase in the last six years. And in terms of ease of doing business also, we have been improving our rank. So clearly, there is a lot of dynamism which is there in the current science, technology and innovation ecosystem that can be felt, that can be realized, not only in terms of the newer products which are entering the market, but also the new startups which are coming up, bringing in these technology goods for the larger set of population. This was in fact a very new policy which was initiated jointly by the Office of uh, Principal Scientific Advisor and Department of Science and Technology. If we look at the Science Policy Resolution of 1958, the aim was to foster, promote and sustain uh, basically the cultivation of uh, science and scientific research in all aspects. The technology policy statement of 83 uh, emphasized the need to integrate programs of uh, social economic sector with national R&D system and creation of national innovation system. Science technology policy of 2003 uh, brought the benefits of STI to the forefront and also focused on the investment required for research and development along with the national innovation system. STIP 2013 focused on a large demographic dividend and set the paradigm science, technology and innovation for people. So in that context, now if you look at this TIP 2020, it is focused on core principles of being decentralized, being in evidence informed, having a bottom up approach and expert driven and inclusive. Being decentralized, essentially the idea here is that more, many more ministries which, which will be requiring now the outcome of the science and technological change would be rather part of this policy. Evidence informed, where you look forward to the policy documents which has found some kind of an evidence with respect to the impact of those maybe in the international context in developed or developing economies. There has been various stakeholders that has been engaged in it. We will look at them and thus establishing a bottom up approach. Moreover, it is extremely expert driven. We have various committees that was being uh, formulated in order to discuss different aspects and it is also being very inclusive. So what we found that there was this process which comes from the Science Policy Forum website. It highlights that there were major four tracks. The first track included the extended public and expert consultation. Then there was thematic group consultation. Like I said earlier, many experts were being engaged in the process. So they were being made part of this policy formulation during the track two. Then there was also a consultation with ministries and the states which are going to now use the final outcome that would be coming from the technological growth. Say for instance, now you are looking at the water crisis in a particular economy. Now, if, say for instance, a DST or a Ministry of uh, Science and Technology asks for certain research projects in the area of the uh, water conservation. Ultimately, the objective would be that it should be used by that particular ministry. Hence, their consultation, there is, there is a need to bring them and make an important stakeholder in this entire process of the policy making. Lastly, an apex level multi-stakeholder consultation so that whatever the issues and the concerns which has emerged can be thrashed out, can be looked at and then what we have in the end is extremely robust policy. So the draft of STI policies uh, document, like I said, in the track one, it extended public and expert consultation and intended to build an archive of public voices so that the policy could be guided in a way where the concern of the society has been talked about. Track two, thematic group consultation included 21 expert led themes collective that will provide the again evidence based recommendation because these experts would have an access to the literature or maybe the different drafts which come with respect to the policy evaluation. Ministries and state consultation, they bring uh, different uh, stakeholders once again for the substantial interaction through appointed nodal office. Last track on apex level multi-stakeholder is a unifying factor which draw on the highest level of multi-stakeholder engagement at the national and global level. There is a lot more available about this draft on the science policy forum as I have highlighted earlier. So in the end, what do we have? So here I have picked up few uh, key recommendations which has emerged from this extremely uh, inclusive and elaborate uh, consultation process. Let us look at the key recommendations emerging from this policy. 
The first is to have a national STI observatory. It has been realized that the science and technology related works are undertaken in the various agencies and which are also funded by the public. So there is a need to create a repository of all the data or the, all the results which has been generated through that particular public funded uh, research as such. As a result, a STI observatory has been thought of to be such a repository. Another idea is to have an open science framework. The public funded generated research should be available and should be able to be accessible by everybody. The results related to that, the data which has been generated can be made available through this open science framework. The idea here is to have the so called fair term where it means findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable terms should be there in order to provide that results and data from that scientific research. In order to promote Interdisciplinary research in the universities, higher education research centers and collaborative research centers has also been proposed. Moreover, in order to create an innovative landscape for financial requirement of science and technology, it has been suggested that we should be following hybrid funding models. In such models, the engagement of the private sector through CSIR funding has also been talked about. Most importantly, there is a discussion on establishing a STI development bank. Such a bank can support the long term and the medium term research projects which are of importance for the country. There is a suggestion that advanced tools based on AI and ML should be used in order to curate, preserve and maintain the heritage knowledge. The focus on indigenous knowledge is much required. Lastly, there is another interesting suggestion about uh, establishment of strategic uh, technology board. This is in alignment with the objective to become self-reliant when it comes to technology development. Here the idea is that such a board will be able to identify the areas in which special efforts need to be made. And hence, through this Science, Technology and Innovation Policy 2020, the focus is to become a self-reliant economy over a period of a time. Thank you so much. With this, we'll be ending this module and uh, I look forward to have, your, have a discussion with you all on the Friday.